Hello, and welcome to Cyberdeck Users Weekly, a bi weekly podcast about how to use technology. And today we have a, a very special guest. I'm Paul, by the way, and I'm joined by Richard Myers, a decentralized applications engineer at Global Mesh Labs, which I don't know if you're familiar with this podcast, but decentralized seems to be a major theme for us. So the fact that it's in your job title is kind of kind of exciting to me. Cool. Thanks, Paul. I'm excited to uh, talk to you today. So uh, I've heard you on uh, Tales from the Crypt and on the Stefan Levera podcast, and I want to dive into what you're working on, but also... I want people to know that if we gloss over something, there's a lot of stuff. You've given some talks. They're on YouTube. People can find them. There's a lot of explanations of this technology uh, you're working on, uh, like Lot49 and what Global Mesh Labs is and and Gotenna in general. Um, So, but yeah, just basically as as a short overview, who are you and what do you do? Sure. So I'm I'm working for uh, a sub part of Gotenna which makes consumer devices, which we'll get into later, but that enable basically the world's first consumer mobile mesh network. Um, but the Global Mesh Labs uh, initiative is really focused on open, it's an open source initiative to um, incentivize essentially, you know, global mesh, a global mesh, a global communication network based on mesh technology uh, and, and doing that through incentivization um, and, and that's the Lot 49 uh, protocol, which we can talk about too. And that's uh, also based on the Bitcoin Lightning protocol. So it's it's essentially a, a version of Bitcoin Lightning used to incentivize mesh communication. And so and so, get Gotenna is a, they they make an actual real consumer electronics product that people can buy. Like you take it camping, so you can like. Uh, maybe you could explain it a little bit uh, better than I could, but it's a little little box. <laughs> yeah, to the yeah phone. You, I, I, this is where video would be nice. But you just imagine something like the size, a little larger than a than a, a cigarette lighter, uh, and it'll pair with a mobile phone, so Android or iOS, uh, over Bluetooth, and it and then it acts as a essentially a walkie-talkie for digital data, and the app on your phone is going to look just like WhatsApp, uh, like um, yeah, WhatsApp or any of your sort of messaging applications. But instead of going over the internet, it's going to work um, peer-to-peer. So it's going to go through your paired Gotenna radio to another Gotenna, which is in range. Um, mm-hmm. But what makes it a real interesting product is it's not just a walkie-talkie where it goes one-to-one. It's actually a mesh product. So it's going to hop from the nearest radio over multiple radios that are, you know, that are consecutively in range until it reaches its destination. Uh, and this this is really the first time consumers have had that technology. Although mesh radios have been around since the '80s, um, this is really a you know, first time a mobile system like this has been available for consumers. Yeah, and so what what are the actual practical like? How are people using these right now? I think for the biggest use that we have actually two products, but the consumer one you can get is really used mostly by outdoorsy people. So if you're out hiking or you know in some place where maybe mobile connectivity isn't too good then that's probably the number one use case. Um, and then the, probably the secondary use case would be people who are just uh, concerned about disaster scenarios. So they might want to have one in the drawer. Maybe they use it outdoors, but then they want to have it so if the power goes out for a period of time, you know, Hurricane Sandy hits again in New York, you have some way to communicate with people um, when the mobile network's down mm-hmm. or there's no internet. So that's that's the sort of preppers and... Preppers and outdoorsy people is, is, and then there's a lot of smaller groups that do it. Like we have a group of people who fly ultralight gliders and they use it to connect with each other when they're up in the air. So this is, there's some other groups that also use it, but I think it's mostly the, the preppers and the outdoorsy people who, who use these. And it's, um, I mean, it's a, it's a pretty, lo- it's pretty long range. It's longer than your average walkie, or at least my experience with walkie talkies, maybe <laughs> I have bad walkie talkies. Yeah. Well, the technology for even like normal voice walkie talkies have gotten pretty good, but I think because it's digital too, that gives us ability to to do communicate over probably longer range than probably the same power and frequency doing voice. Um, we I think on the website we say four miles, um, but of course with anything with radio, it's going to depend on where you're where you're at. So if you're standing on a hill, you can get probably further with you know clear line of sight to somebody. But if it's you're on a, a glider, you know, if you're up in a glider, that are, are 
our mileage sort of distance winner were, were, was a guy in a glider connecting, you know, with no other interference, you know, just air between them. Uh, I don't remember what the, the record was, but it, but it was a lot further than, than we put on the website. Um, but again, if you were like in New York City and it's a crowded place with a lot of buildings, then it's going to be shorter. Um, but there's yep. a nice trade-off there because higher density places you would expect in, in a sort of, uh, you know, a meshed society, you're going to have more people to do multiple hops off of. Whereas and when, is that yeah. uh, the mesh network as it is currently, is that um, like I'll just hop off of anybody I can connect to or can you shut down your device if you don't want to like relay? I, I don't know, like if, if your yeah. device can be overwhelmed. Well, if the power's on, it will relay. So even if it's not, um, even if it's not paired with your phone, they just automatically relay when they receive messages. That's just in the firmware. Okay. Um, uh, so, so yeah. if I bought if I bought a, a Gotenna mesh and I just plugged it into the wall um, and just had it on, mm-hmm. uh, I would be basically improving the resiliency of the mesh network in Brooklyn. Yeah, exactly, exactly. In fact, we have something called the Rise Program. Um, which is an initiative I think the city put together to try to increase the resiliency of, of New York generally. And they've actually been giving um, merchants or, you know, giving, uh, you know, store, store operators go tennis with a little solar panel and, um, and in like a waterproof bag. So in case of disaster, these people can sort of become the, the backbone of a, of a communication network you oh. know, after a disaster. So that, that's a pretty cool program in, in your, your town. That's awesome. I got I got to look into that. So 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 y- you guys have this I w- I don't want to say against all odds but uh, it feels <laughs> like that it says that it, it started on Kickstarter, right? Yeah, exactly. So so you have this thing that like, oh, well that would be cool if it worked, but you know, well, and then it launched, it mm-hmm. worked, and then you came out with the mesh product that worked, but it seems like you guys have some grander ambitions that are are leading into like this global mesh labs project. Yeah, uh, I mean, there's there's a challenge with mesh networks, and you know we have a great product; it it works as advertised. But to really create a, a a system that can start to compete against your centralized mobile infrastructure, you know, your cell phone network, um, that's a big challenge, and and it, it's usually referred to as like the zero start problem. Mm-hmm. If nobody's using, you know, if you're the first person with a mobile phone, there's nobody to call, so you're not going to use it. So how do you jumpstart these networks and get enough coverage so that it can that it can become a ubiquitous network that is always available when you need it or or in any place where you you need it and i mean i remember i'm old enough to remember cell phones at one point had to overcome that problem too you know they had to find a way you know and and there was if you really want to go back to cell phones the earliest cell phones actually were much longer range because they didn't have the density of towers um, and now as technology as more people have been using it the density the the, the data rate goes higher, but the range goes lower. This is always this trade-off between power, range, and bandwidth. Um, so, so there's two things we're doing with Gotenna Mesh to try to make it possible to create these like really well-connected mesh networks. And one is range. So, like that four-mile range is a lot longer than your Wi-Fi network. Now, there are people doing mesh over Wi-Fi, but there's there's these trade-offs in that you know, would need a lot more Wi-Fi nodes to create a mesh than you would. Um, the Gotenna like range of kind of radio. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, that's the first sort of way Gotenna is trying to make these more of a ubiquitous alternative to, to other, other ways to communicate. Um, but then what I've sort of come on board to try to get going is this idea of incentivization. Um, and what that means is, you know, right now, if somebody, like you were saying, if, if you relay for somebody else, that might drain a little bit of your battery or, or it means you have to remember to turn it on. Um, but you know, economics has shown that even a little bit of incentive can go a long way to get people to change their behavior. And maybe they leave it on, they have it connected onto their backpack and they just leave it on when they're walking around the city. Um, Mm -hmm. or like you said, you keep it in the window. Um, we can talk about the lightning network, but yeah, that's that's sort of the way the lightning network works now is it's not, you don't make a lot of money for relaying payments between different nodes, but even a little bit of incentive is enough to get people to go to the effort to, to add their support to, to the connectivity of the network. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's what Global Mesh Labs is doing, is we're, we're creating open source protocols to make that possible using the Bitcoin Lightning Network, which we'll, we'll have to get into a little later. But, um, 
but that's but but what we're doing isn't really exclusive to GoTen either. We we envision not just that like GoTen is could be or will certainly be a part of this global mesh, but we see you know other radios. There there are you know maybe ham operators you know using those kind of like long distance radios or Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or you know any modality could all be sort of speaking the same language and interconnecting through gateways. Um, but all being incentivized by the same protocol. So that's really our our vision for for not just jumpstarting, not just making like a Gotenna network, but really making a global network of meshed devices. Uh, that's the, our big the, vision. The, it is, uh, and I love this vision. There's, I mean, on this podcast, uh, and, and just the way I've been thinking in general, there's a lot of there's a lot of things I wish were decentralized. Uh, and then when they someone tries to decentralize them, I don't like the end result. And a lot of ta- a lot of times, it's either you know it actually is centralized; it's just like a shell game, or uh, it has like a serious tragedy of the commons, lowest common denominator situation because it doesn't have some some safeguard against spam or or or, or, or something along those lines. Like I think of email. Um, like I feel like email got centralized by Google because nobody yeah. else could handle handle spam, you know. And I'm paying Mailchimp, you know, a, a lot more dollars than I would think necessary to send out my newsletter just because you know they they have high reputation, you know, mail sending, and I don't want all of my emails to end up in a, a spam box. So you know, email is a permissionless decentralized <laughs> system in theory, but it, it is kind of broken in a lot of ways. Yeah, it's funny you mention that. I, I think email is an excellent cautionary tale for any decentralized network. And it's like you said, I mean, in, I was just talking to my brother about this the other day, you know, we're trying to think about ways you could be more, you know, self custodial of your data. Hmm. But it's but like what you were alluding to there is even if you did run your own mail server, you had it all sort of piped straight to your home. If you tried to send mail, you'd go on a blacklist of spammers because they don't know who you are. You know, you don't have all these you don't have um, the the pull that somebody like Mailchimp has, for example. Right. Uh, so it's yeah, it's it's a danger for sure. And one of the things we had to consider when we were looking at this, I mean, it would have been way easier to do an incentivization system if we could have relied on a centralized system. So, like PayPal, for example, you know, you could just say, when when I when I relay a message through you, I just I sign something saying, you know, here I owe you a penny. And then that guy can go to PayPal and say, okay, I got all these IOUs, give me all the pennies, and boom, you're done. I mean, from a bandwidth standpoint, that would be an excellent solution. Uh, and it would, it would not need internet connectivity that often. You know, you could do a lot of things with that. But, but then the choke point isn't like the centralized ISP. Now it's PayPal, as, as it is in many right. cases. So, so we've had to really wrestle with that, that well, uh, trade-off. So if you want to... Re- a replace or augment uh, or pro- improve upon or offer an alternative to current mobile telephone networks. And, and obviously it, by doing it decentralized, you have a lot more work to do. Maybe we could go through some of the, the motivations for that. Like what, what is, what's up with the, the, the system as it exists and what's wrong with the system as it exists? Why is it worth challenging? Yeah, there's, there's really three reasons I usually talk about. I mean, one is we've sort of alluded to is, is resiliency. So even though we, you know, we live in a highly connected society and everything we, we do sort of depends on the internet, uh, and it works most of the time, but it fails. And when it fails, it, you know, it's nice to have a system that doesn't completely fail, a system where I could still get a message out or I could still, you know, like hospital could still connect to the fire department. Um, I mean, maybe they have some systems, but if, if you had a whole society that wasn't so fragile in their communications, then I think you know, real disasters like Hurricane Katrina and things like that, um, a lot of, a lot of um, bad things could have been prevented. Mm. But that's just looking at the U.S. If you look at the rest of the world, there are many places where it's like you know, Hurricane Sandy all the time, um, places where they just have either many more disasters. Um, uh, like if you look at what happened in Puerto Rico, for example, it was a horrible storm, but the infrastructure was already very weak, and, and it took them, you know, many weeks to maybe months actually to fully recover their ability to communicate. Um, so, so the resiliency argument um, is a pretty strong one, although that's a hard one to make because people don't usually think about it till it's too late. 
So, so you, you would really like there to be better motivation than that, just so people are already have it in place when they need it. Um, so another one is, um, I guess you could say censorship basically, um, that, you know, in maybe in New York, this isn't quite as much of an issue, but really in a lot of parts of the world, um, censorship is something that is a reality. There's a great uh, Twitter site called NetBlocks where they show the internet, uh, they, they, they have like a way to, to sort of, they've instrumented the internet. They've got a lot of people all over the world and they can tell when certain sites or certain like entire countries go dark on the internet. Uh, and it's a, it's not just a common occurrence, but it's like an increasingly common occurrence, uh, countries like Turkey and Iran. And, you know, it's not even just the most totalitarian, like North Korea and China. It's, it's everything in between, you know, it's going on all the time and we don't know it. So in those places, censor, uh, censorship is a real, is a real like thing. Uh, and that's a kind of resiliency that I think people would appreciate. I mean, I'm sure the people in Hong Kong would appreciate this right now. And I, I hope some are using Gotenna's because I think it can help, um, can help them not just from a censorship standpoint, but the third thing is, is also, um, surveillance. We live in a, you know, it was one of these things that we had this sort of wake up call when Edward Snowden revealed the, the censorship, uh, the surveillance that was going on, even in Western democracies. And we all used to joke about the NSA tapping our phone lines, but the reality of it, it you know, is a pretty staggering fact. And having a, a censorship resistant technology, even if it's not one, uh, uh, like a, sorry, I meant surveillance resistant technology, even if it's not one that everybody has, um, but just making that a more common thing uh, can really only help keep society free, in my opinion, you know, well, create an immune system against, against this kind of surveillance. Well, that was something interesting uh, you brought up on, I forget if it was the St- Stefan Levera or the Tales from the Crypt. You guys, everybody's just got a list of both episodes. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> but this idea that like, even, even if the individual, this is how you were saying it, but even if the individual communication between point A and point B is no more secure than it is right now, surveilling a mesh network requires listeners everywhere instead of with the current uh, way the internet's set up, you know, we just route all of our traffic through the NSA yeah. and they, they, they put it all in hard drives or whatever <laughs> they do with it, you know, and store it forever until they can crack it with, with, you know, advanced tools that, yeah. that they're developing, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I, I didn't really go into that, but, but you reminding me of sort of my, my train of thought in that episode was, was interesting because you, you might, you might consider yourself, well, you know, this whole idea, nothing, nothing, you got nothing to hide. So, so why should you be afraid of surveillance? Um, but it isn't just surveillance. It's not, it's not just that you don't have anything to hide today in our current sort of really free democracy. It's what might you have to hide in the future? Because all this stuff can be recorded, put in a mountain somewhere in Nevada, and then you do something, you anger the wrong, uh, you know, borderline totalitarian ruler and they can dig it all up. They can, you know, maybe they, then they, then they get your password. Then they do something to get your password and they can go and decrypt all that information back or, or use some other technique. And I, I wrote an article about this and mostly I just wanted to use this title, but, but I believe it too, that it's what I call the eye of Sauron problem. <laughs> it's okay if you're just a little hobbit hob, you know, in your little village, but as soon as that, you know, the, the, the apparatus of the state focuses on you, um, you're in big trouble. And it would yeah. be nice to have tools that made that less of a problem. And the same is for sen- and the same is true of censorship too. I mean, censorship is this central kill switch that could be just turned off, and that's how it's used in in a lot of countries. Um, whereas if everybody is running a piece of the internet essentially on their own device, then there isn't just one place you can go and just hit that kill switch. So, like you were saying, you can't. It's not just that you can't tap one place. You also can't turn off from just one place, uh, people's ability to communicate with each other. Well, then to make it a little more topical, uh, and maybe we're already preaching to the converted, but, you know, I, I haven't quite decided to do with my, what to do with my phone. Like Android has an update for me. And I know that is adding the contact tracing API. Mm. And I perhaps naively believe that they have done their best to make it anonymous. But I, it, it's it's like that, yeah. The Eye of Sau- Sauron, like, were the Eye of Sauron really interested in my exact behavior and movements and who I've come into contact with? 
mm-hmm. feels like, you know, I mean, how long has Google been working on this versus, and, you know, App, and Apple been working on this versus how, how much time and effort is the government willing to put into <laughs> cracking the case and figuring out, you know, everything I've been up to. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's, there's a funny thing with privacy in general too, that, um, Sure, like maybe you could turn it off. Maybe you, you know, maybe you're somebody like Edward Snowden who's really, who knows he's going to be in the crosshairs and he could turn it off. But once you've deployed that on everyone's phone, then the guy who's hiding, the guy who's encrypting his communication, the guy who's That's doing something, he stands out now. <laughs> mm. So so by making it ubiquitous, it makes the person who tries to dodge it, like the, the guy, it, it's a funny iron, irony with the whole COVID thing in that, if you were walking around with a mask, like you were the one attracting attention. Um, and in some ways, normalizing masks has made it easier for somebody to kind of maintain their privacy against their ubiquitous uh, video surveillance. Um, but that's really true in the digital world, too, that when, you know, by making tools, some, by making security and privacy and censorship resistance, by making that just a common tool, by normalizing that, then the person who, then the person who really needs it, the person who's a, Edward Snowden, for example, he doesn't stand out. His activity on the internet doesn't stand out. And conversely, if everybody's surveilled and everybody's, you know, has this, this spyware installed on their phone, then maybe that one guy who doesn't have the spyware is going to trigger alarms, the guy who probably really needed it. Right. So it's a hiding in a crowd is a very important aspect here. And I think personal security, not, you know, or collective security in a way, you know, creating an immune system against these things. And, and, and you're hoping that by making it very difficult, it won't be attempted. That's, that's a big part of this too. If a, 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 a RAN knows that they can't censor something, then it's quite likely they won't try or, you know, they wouldn't waste their prestige to try to stop something that, that couldn't be stopped because of the existence of these, these other alternative systems. So let's, let's, let's give a, a little more mundane uh, use case. I'm just thinking of my current situation. You know, I've been locked down, but there's a coffee shop that's open. You're allowed to like four people at a time are allowed in the coffee shop. So you wait outside until it clears out, go in and get your <laughs> coffee. I boop to pay. I like, I, you know, I swipe my phone. So, you know, every, everybody knows what's going on with me right now. <laughs> um, so I can imagine an alternative situation. And look, so the main things I need my phone for are messaging and payments right now. Um, and obviously, you know, I could use cash, I could do other things, but this is how I'm using it. Um, and then, you know, like, uh, yeah, but I like to like download podcasts and use my mobile data, but I don't have to do that. I could preload them and stuff, but these are things that I can't do without an internet connection right now out in the world is texting Mm -hmm. and payments. So if this cash, um, if this coffee shop had a lightning terminal, and I could walk in there and boop my phone, mm-hmm. and then magically over the over the lot forty nine <laughs> protocol, somehow that that transaction is routed to my Lightning node or is routed over the Lightning network, uh, and so I've create I've successfully you know completed my payment, and maybe I also can send a text message, um, you know, yo, I got the coffee, everything's good, I'm still alive. Uh, and, 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 and I didn't have to use the internet. Like I could cancel Verizon. I could turn off Wi-Fi on my phone. Like I, I, I'd feel a little more free. So, so let's talk about lot 49 and, and, and how this would try to tackle that problem. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, I like that thinking about it in a use case like that, because that is, that is the challenge a lot of times is how do you fit to something new into somebody's lifestyle so that they, that it actually makes sense. And, I mean, it's good you mentioned SMS because I, I, I think that 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 I didn't mention this about what we what we do with the Gotenna right now, but we are really bad with constraints. So you're not going to be using it to make a phone call or to uh, stream your your latest episode of whatever. It's really for what we kind of consider essential communication. So SMS is, which really is sort of the majority. I mean, SMS it also means uh, text messaging, IMs, things like that. But that that size of data. Um, so. And then Lightning Network is for payments. I think maybe it's worth, do you think it's worth just sort of describing a little bit about how the Lightning Network works? Maybe that's a good intro. Yeah, yeah. So so, so, so there's Bitcoin, 
that we, we refer to that as the layer one. Right. And you you make payment, and they are settled finally and forever onto the Bitcoin blockchain every every ten minutes. Mm-hmm. And that's a little slow uh, for paying for coffee. Yeah, and this this I mean yeah for Bitcoin historians like you can go back. There was a real debate about this whether that layer one really should be the layer that you're using to buy your coffee. And and the the winning uh, sort of idea that came out of this is that. Really, layer one is for settlements because it, it's it's final but slow. And um, another interesting thing about that is you're paying by the byte, so um, you're paying you're paying for every not by the amount that gets transferred. So you could be transferring five dollars for coffee, or you could be transferring five million dollars to buy a yacht, and it would cost you the same in transaction fees because it's the same amount of data that gets stored forever on the blockchain. So ultimately, fees are going to go up as demand goes up because there's a limited space on the blockchain for this, this valuable transaction data. Uh, so the solution there is how can we, um, how can we do more transactions, but use less block space to do, do have less of it recorded. Um, so in the layer one, your transaction is recorded on the global blockchain. It's stored forever, not just on your computer, but on every node, anywhere in the world and any node that will ever exist because it's stored forever. So it should, should be expensive and, and eventually will be expensive to store stuff there. Um, instead, the way the Lightning Network works is um, we, th- there's this construct that, that's been talked about for a long time called a payment channel. What that means is two people, two nodes, uh, establish a payment channel by locking value. Some uh, You can think of it like a bar tab. I'm going to go to the bar and I'm going to put 20 bucks down. That's on my tab. And then every time I, I drink a beer, the barkeep, he doesn't have to break that fiber or that 20, whatever. He, he just makes a mark, okay, one beer, one beer, one beer. And then at the end of the night, we settle it. We, see, we, we add it all up and then do it in the cash register. So like from a high level, that's how the Lightning Network works. And an interesting observation that I've heard people make is you're not recording that information with everybody in the world at all time. And you're not transferring that you know, every time you buy a beer, you're not announcing it globally to be recorded everywhere in the world you're only communicating with the person you have this channel with so it saves blockchain space because you're not recording this globally it actually saves bandwidth because you're not you're not forcing every node in the network to echo this information over the you know peer to peer with their peers and, and get that sort of to come to a consensus you're you're really localizing it just to the person you're communicating with um, but if you had to open a channel with everybody you wanted to pay, pay for a, you know, pay, pay with the lightning transaction or a payment channel, you would sort of end up in the same situation because you're not always going to know who you want to pay. You know, you might be walking down the street and you want to buy spontaneously buy an ice cream and, you know, you don't have a payment channel with that person. Um, so that's why we call it the lightning network, because I may have a payment channel with my coffee shop that I go to every day. Uh, and then they have payment channels with their customers and maybe with a few other nearby businesses. And um, you can imagine all these pairwise connections form a network. And as long as there's a path from me through my connections to who I want to pay, um, then you can do it, you know, you can, I guess, pay it forward in a way. So I pay you, I'm going to buy an ice cream, so I pay you two bucks. Um, and I say, here's two bucks. Um, you can have it. If you give me proof that you delivered it to the ice cream guy, I mean, at a high level, that's that's really what we're saying, and and you've already got a route that they're going to pass it, and the, the the routing is done privately, so they they don't know who they're passing it, or they don't know where the eventual destination is. They just know, okay, you know, this is the next guy I got to pass it to. So it's this hopscotching from node to node uh, in on the internet until it gets to the ice cream guy. Uh, he sees, oh, great, here I just got two bucks. Um, and in exchange, I will give you this information. And this information is proof that I received it. And as that flows back through the network, all these nodes, nodes know that that money that was committed for the proof is now money good. And, and what I mean by money good is that even if I, the one who originally did the payment, disappear, my, I drop the phone in the toilet or I, I, or I just, just turn it off because I don't want to make that payment after all, I'm trying to gyp them. Um, this cryptographic proof is 
enough to complete that payment on the internet, uh, on the blockchain, so on the actual layer one. So you can think of it almost like uh, a final judge is the is the is the layer one Bitcoin blockchain, and um, you don't want to go to the final judge. You don't want you know that's a big hassle. It's going to cost you some transaction fees, but there's always this known um, fact that if it's not completed, you can fall back to this to to this final layer one. Um, but as long as you're doing things on layer two, it never touches layer one. Until you know, it only t- touches layer one when you first open a channel with somebody, you know, with your first hop, and then that channel stays open, you're not touching layer one. And then if you want to close it, then you would have to close it. And that's when you decide, okay, I, I gave you, I paid for ice cream six times. So, okay, I, you know, I get this much, you get that much. And then you close the channel and then it settles that on layer one. Um, but in between, in between opening and closing that channel, you could have paid anybody in the network. You could have paid them and you could have both paid and received value. So it can go both ways. You, people could be forwarding through you. You could be receiving payments, maybe from your employer. Um, so all this can be going on. You can have thousands, hundreds of thousands, you know, really a large number of transactions that never touch layer one. And uh, that means that even if layer one, even if the opening and closing transactions are expensive, you've, you've just um, aggregated all of this, all of this uh, activity over just a very small number of actual layer one transactions. So, uh, yeah, so that's, that's, how, that's how lightning works. You know, maybe yeah. if you got some questions about that, and then I'll tell you how that leads us to the mesh version of that. Well, I just know that lightning is, is a novel concept to some people who have heard of Bitcoin. And when I heard of lightning, uh, it was kind of in the like, um, I remember the, the Bitcoin cash people being very like, oh, well, they think they'll scale with this unproven technology, you know, like, good luck with that. You know, we have a proven technology, bigger, <laughs> bigger blocks. Yeah, uh, and I didn't know who to believe at first, and then Lightning seems to have worked, and and it has these interesting properties that incentivize, like you explaining this, like you know, peer to peer to peer thing, mm. like this. Uh, it's called onion routing in the sense that you know, I I'm trying to, I'm trying to get money from my coffee shop to the ice cream man, you know, because I don't have a direct relationship with the ice cream man. Yeah, um, uh, but but I, I I'm not telling my coffee shop when I hand them that that lightning transaction exactly who the destination is all they know is the next hop on 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 the route and they also can um, set a fee so they don't have to route my 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 message only if I pay them what they're asking right. uh, so it's got a, a lot of like really interesting properties to, to incentivize running lightning nodes uh, to incentivize being highly connected to peers to have some liquidity in there and then also there's the um uh, reverse incentive of you know if you don't behave well on the lightning network then you have to go settle on the the bitcoin blockchain which is expensive right Um, and you don't really want to be like opening and closing channels all the time because that's kind of expensive so there's a lot of really interesting properties to make a a network that people want to be a be a part yeah. of and can benefit from. It creates a like a marketplace for this stuff, you know, marketplace for exchange for passing on payments. And you know, maybe a, I w- what you were saying that I realized there was one other aspect that's maybe worth mentioning is um, it's a lot like the Tor network. So this onion routing that you mentioned means that when I decide this route, I I form the route and then I pass it on. And and the reason I'm the reason I'm doing that is because I might not be paying for ice cream. I might be paying for a peep shop, you know, down one door down. And I don't want, I don't want you anybody on the network to know it. that. <laughs> so, so it's, you know, financial privacy is really baked into this um, in a way that it isn't into your credit card. Um, you know, that you, you make that same kind of purchase on your credit card and you might hear about it later. It's going to show up in your, you know, bill that's mailed home, or it could also just be something that the government decides, well, you know, our visa network isn't for that kind of thing, or I mean, maybe peep shop's not a good example. You could say, you know, you're donating to your church and, you know, this particular place, that kind of church isn't allowed. So those transactions aren't allowed either. So you get financial privacy, but it also gives you, because it's private, it also gives you a kind of censorship resistance. So they can't, those payments can't be stopped because nobody knows where they're going. Nobody, nobody can tell. Um, it's, 
And so you saw this protocol and, and you were like, I bet I could make an internet out of that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a pretty, it's not, not such a stretch. I mean, that's the cool thing. I mean, I've described the way a mesh network works. It's, you know, the, the biggest difference conceptually is that now instead of a virtual overlay network on the internet, I mean, even though it feels like I can send a packet of information anywhere in the world, it's actually hopping in the same way as a mesh network. It's, going from my local router to my local ISP, and then maybe it's going to some hubs, uh, you know, ISP meeting places that, that routes it to some part of the world. And, you know, this is all done in a kind of a hierarchical way. But to you, it feels invisible. It just feels like it goes from point A to point B. Well, in a mesh network, that's, that's also true, but it's really a physical range-based uh, based routing. So I broadcast, and, and then it, it hits somebody and, and hops and hops and hops. And so the, the analogy with lightning that's pretty easy to make here is I want to incentivize my next hop to get that data delivered to where I want it to go. So it, he's going to get that data and route it over multiple hops. And when it, you know, physical hops, not, not just sort of virtual internet hops until it gets to the destination. And then when that person um, receives the data, they reveal a secret. And that's as that secret flows back through this radio network each person is able to collect one of these little payments. So it's, it's, I, I even have a hard time sometimes. We call it Lot 49 because it's really, there are differences than Lightning, but not Bitcoin differences, not differences in, in that sort of basic structure. It's really more about how do we do this in a way that's going to work for a bandwidth limited network? How, how are we going to do this over a different kind of protocol than the internet protocol? Um, but otherwise, it's, it's very conceptually similar. And finding another node is going to be different. You know, you're not going to be able to connect to any node in the, in the world. You're only going to be able to have your first hop connection, somebody in range. So that, that changes things. But, but once it's established, um, the basic, and then there's another part of it too, is that we want to use this to deliver data. So whereas the initial conception of the lightning network is just to deliver payments, um, very rapidly people realize that this is like a Tor network and, there's projects like Juggernaut. I think when you talked to Matt, you talked about Juggernaut, maybe? Yeah, he I brought it up. Yeah, so Juggernaut is an example of using this, uh, the current Lightning Network to send uh, private messages over the internet. Uh, and it could be anything. I mean, it could be packetized data. There are people working on just making, making it basically a, a plug-in replacement for Tor. Um, so that's, that's, that's how we achieve our vision of a decentralized communication network is by not just the, the payments are almost are, are really secondary to the fact that you're paying for di- data to be delivered. And um, that's, yeah, that's lot 49 is, is just that idea um, of, of juggernaut, or there's a few others. One's called what's at what's at what's at. <laughs> there's a few others out there. Sphinx pay, I believe these are all ways that um, you can use the lightning network, not just to transfer value, but data. Um, but, but you're, you're, conceiving of this is pretty broad like this is internet data like like tcp traffic or or right now is it mostly just messages for us initially it would just be messages some of these other projects i think are starting to look down the road at being a really plug-in replacement for tor where it is just arbitrary data like a access to a website or socket transports Mm -hmm. um we're starting with messages and a lot of that is because of the bandwidth we're dealing with. We, we, we don't have internet level of bandwidth, um, but we do see that messages are really uh, one of these essential applications you've got to have. And we think that if you can get a ubiquitous network with even minimal bandwidth uh, applications, like uh, sending your location or sending, you know, s- sending your location to a friend or sending an SMS or sending a payment, you know, all three are very low bandwidth. Once you get that wedge in the door, then it's easy to scale up to higher bandwidth, and then it could really become an internet replacement. At that point, it could, it could, it could be that you know ubiquitous internet that we really would have as an endpoint. But we'd be very happy just to start with just a messaging network that's incentivized. That would be a good start. So, so how would the Lot Forty Nine network like work in, in practice? If I if we're going back to my coffee shop example, I'm going to make a payment. I'm going to uh, text my sister that I got some coffee. Mm-hmm. So so the payment we just talked about. So that's that's the idea of let's say you're on the internet making the payment. Then it's going to go from your Lightning 
next channel partner until it gets to the destination. But now let's imagine you don't have internet. So now we're doing this over the mesh and we want to send an SMS to your sister. Um, so it's going to, we're going to assume that somewhere in your range, just like, you know, maybe your coffee shop is, has a mesh device or, or maybe somebody in your building has a mesh device or, you know, there's there, you're within range of, and because the range is large, you're within range of somebody who you've already opened a connection I, with. I don't want to dox myself, but my coffee shop is less than four miles away from me. So I could have a, <laughs> right. You could have it at home even potentially yeah. if you really, um, but yeah, so so the idea there is that you you would have a channel partner, and if you didn't have a channel partner, you would discover and you would have to do an on-chain transaction to establish that initial channel partnership. So if you were in a new city or you were in a new part of the, the neighborhood, maybe you would open up a channel um, with somebody else. But but here we'll just assume that a channel exists. Um, you would package up that message, the message to your sister, and now an, an important detail that's a little that's kind of common to all of these communication protocols is you, um, because you're delivering the data, then the, the proof that needs to be given at the other end. So um, I'm trying to think of how to say this, but so let's say you, you've got a text message. You can, you can do something called hashing. So you can create a code out of that message. And now as you pass it from hop to hop to hop, um, each of these mesh relays who, who is, going to agree to a payment if they if they broadcast it to the next hop um, is waiting for that for the basically some information that only the person who receives the message and decrypts it so you're gonna sorry i missed a step you're gonna take the message you're gonna encrypt it so only your sister can read it that's important and then but before you encrypt it into this secret uh, message you're gonna take a hash of it you're gonna get a, a, a very small summary of that message that only the person who can decrypt the message is going to be able to generate. So that's how you can safely send it from hop to hop to hop. And each message in each note as they pass it is going to get a commitment for a payment if that secret is revealed. Then when you're right, system, so if yeah. the message makes it the whole way, yeah. then, then you'll get paid. So your incentive is to put the message on a good path. Yeah, your message, if it's incrementally routed, so here it might not be source routed. It may not, it may be more like the internet where you just say, I want it to go to, you know, uh, lower Manhattan. And and that's, and then once it gets to lower Manhattan, it unwraps another onion with some more information. You could do something like that. Or you just, you maybe just give your, sis, your sister's ID number, but it's an ID number she can change every hour. So it doesn't matter that it's used uh, as, a, as like a tag on that message. Um, so it's going to hop from node to node, and, and they're going to get this commitment for payment that they can always redeem on the internet if they don't, um, if people fall away. Uh, she's going to get the message, decrypt it, and then generate the hash, and then reveal that hash to the person, the last hop who gave her that message. And then it'll flow back as a like delivery receipt, if you will, back through this, this mesh network until it gets to you. Um, and then when it gets to you, you basically say to your next hop, oh, yeah, good, it got delivered. Here's, you know, now the next time I do a payment, or the next time we do something, we just consider that that you got that payment or, you know, we tally it, we put it on your tally. Mm -hmm. um, so so it, it, you can see there are some decisions you have to make in this kind of network. As a relay, you want to make sure you get paid uh, and, there, and there, you know, there's going to be some risk somewhere. Somebody's got to take the risk. And we, we opted to make the risk being, um, the risk is not to the person sending the message. The risk is really to the person delivering it that it gets delivered. Um, because we didn't want somebody to basically stay in the middle of this mesh and say, get paid in advance and then not deliver it. Just become a, a hole, or like a sinkhole for messages who's just taking payments and never, never um, passing them on. We, we basically want the incentive system to be towards delivered messages. Now, occasionally, you might get a situation where it's delivered, say, to your sister, and she decrypts it, and she gives the receipt, um, but maybe her phone dies at that moment. So, actually, nobody gets paid. So, that would be a failure, and that would be bad. But it wouldn't be, it wouldn't, it still doesn't break the incentive that it's, that more often than not, if you deliver it, you get paid. If she comes back online later, later on, yeah, if if within some window of time it came through, and 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 her motivation to deliver that is that if she's always getting like her next hop, she's going to have maybe a small number of people who are the next who are going to be delivering messages to her, 
And if she never gives the receipt, that's, that's not like an inferred relationship. That's like a direct relationship. If that person never gives you uh, a, a receipt, you know that they're the one that you shouldn't be communicating with. So, or, so I'm at, uh, maybe this is two of the weeds, but now I'm trying to actually <laughs> think about how this works. So uh, let's say I'm in the middle of, of a literal mesh, like a spider web, right? Uh-huh. And I say, I want this message to go to this, this, this person. You know, and then I send it. If I send it out omnidirectionally, yeah. a bunch of nodes pick it up. I guess you said I, I, I'm only sending actually to one uh, chant um, to one person. Yeah, like, we what, what if we, it we're not looking at a broadcast. Like there may be a way to do a broadcast. We haven't gone down that route, but um, but yeah, we're really basically saying that if I I know who the next hop is because it has to be somebody I have a channel with. Um, it's not like a. It's not a a bearer instrument, you know, you need to already have this locked value with the next hop. So you do send it to that next person. So, so you can imagine a path that um, goes off in a weird direction and just never finds its destination. Right. But, but you wouldn't have a, a, an infinite exponential number of paths all trying to like hit, hit the same endpoint. Yeah. Yeah. You, and you wouldn't want that from a communication standpoint either. That, if you know one person was doing that kind of a broadcast everywhere, maybe it works. But when everybody is broadcasting everywhere, um, you know, it's there. The, the reason people really need to get paid for this is it is draining their battery. For example, so if they were relaying a bunch of messages that were never delivered because they were in a path that never reached the destination, then um, you know that's a cost they're not really reimbursed for. Well, and so how does it? Rich, the doesn't like how, how do you how do you know which um, who which next channel to send to? Well, there's a few answers to that. I mean, the GoTenna itself is is one one way to do it. So we we have this routing system. It's called the Vine protocol, and it does something. I've heard uh, I've heard people describe this as ant routing. So as maybe the first time you broadcast, you broadcast to everyone. But when you get the receipt back, you learn that the destiny that you, you, don't, you don't just learn um, like this, that this node A was the one that was the best direction. But you know that A is also the best direction. You know that like the next hop or the, the, next, the, the next two hops from A. So um, that's, I'm not good at describing these mesh algorithms, but it's, a, it's, it's, an, it's an algorithm where if you don't know the destination, you do broadcast to find the route. Not not to do with the lot forty nine, but just as a way to sort of you basically build up a routing table incrementally, mm. so that you know a few hops out where your destination is. And in the most in most cases, that's going to be enough because who you're trying to deliver to is going to be only a few hops out. Um, now that said, really, if you want to think about this as a replacement for the global internet there's probably going to have to be something akin to the internet as far as hierarchical routing. So that's what I was sort of alluding to that you might actually have to give some routing information just like you do with your IP address. And, and that IP information, that sort of hierarchical information would be, you know, if you're, if you're sending to somebody in Tokyo, then that route is going to have to include some information to know you better get to a, a long distance hop pretty quick so that you don't can, just explore your local connections in New York. Yeah. Yeah. So if, so th- there's probably going to have to end up being some sort of hierarchical routing that goes on. And I didn't talk about gateways, but gateways are also a part of this. You can't expect to go hop to hop all around the world, just like the internet. There are, um, you know, local, local hops, and then there are going to be longer distance hops. And, and that might be the internet. That you know, it might be that you get to a gateway that that routes you over the internet to get from New York to Tokyo, um, or it could be you know, if you're in some place where you really have no internet, maybe there's somebody with a satellite uplink, and that guy can charge a lot for his part of the mesh hopping because he's getting you up to a satellite and back. Um, and again, he can pay for his satellite because he's aggregating the in very mu- in sort of small bite at a time. He's at he's able to share uh, what might be considered locally an expensive satellite link, but share it with the entire community. Um, or even mo- one project I can tell you a little bit more about is we're experimenting doing this whole negotiating protocol over amateur radio. I think I sent you a video yesterday where oh, yeah. that, that sort of uh, modem sounding one 
that was an example just showing that this, even though you could do this over Go10MS, you could also do it over amateur radio. And that can go from one end of the US to the other on a radio connection. So could you, you could theoretically do TCP IP with like envelopes and paper if you wanted to. Like a protocol yeah. just describes operations. Yeah, yeah, precisely. I mean, any it's, it's really just a matter of bandwidth and latency. Um, I mean, it would be pretty slow to write it on a piece of paper and pass it hand to hand by envelope, but you could, you could certainly, you could stream video that way if you had a lot of time. Um, so, <laughs> so, and, so, yeah. so this sounds like, uh, I mean, especially I'm glad you mentioned the gateways because it sounds like the most practical version of this would be like, this is, you're going to be maybe one or two hops from the, the real internet, you know, obviously, you know, Gotenna is already helpful in like an emergency situation or whatever, but this sort of doing data, um, you know, in this sort of sort of decentralized fashion, it seems like you're a lot of times going to want to get to the real the real internet, quote unquote. Um, so I guess you know, an extreme. There's going to be a lot of. It's interesting. Like it seems to me that I could put one of these in my window. I could get to the coffee shop, and if and 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 I'm still within four miles, like I could be my own cell phone provider almost like yeah. is that one way you're thinking of it yeah you're you're not only your own cell phone provider but you're a hot spot for anyone else who's using this software and getting a little kickback on your whatever you're paying for your internet gateway you know paying for your internet connection at a sl- small amount of anonymity and crowds that's true yeah that's another good point you you're you now anything traced back to you now potentially could be from someone else you know or it could be you know, or they're obscure, they're sort of, it's a mix net, they're mixing up their traffic with your traffic. And, and you're doing that maybe the same when you're in other places. So you're not, uh, you're not leaving the same kind of breadcrumbs that, and that's not just governments. I mean, you're, you've got a lot of people commercially who are tracking, tracking where you are too. So uh, you can, you can sort of hide in, in a lot of ways in that way. Um, and, and I, you know, we're talking about New York, but there are a lot of parts of the world where, where just internet, just basic internet connectivity is super expensive. And this allows people to, you know, rather than waiting for the government to come in and, and put up a, a cell tower in their village, say, they can just basically stand up their own internet. They can stand up their own communication network just by relaying through each other's devices uh, and, and keeping the value that, you know, for having that connectivity also within their community. So there's, there's a really, I think, a lot of possibilities outside of the Western world um, also where people can can be their own network in places where, where the real current network is either too expensive or just doesn't work at all. Yeah. Well, so I, I, I want to ask some big pic- picture questions, but first wh- where, what's the status on, on lot 49? Like what I, I looked up the white paper, it's a draft 0.85. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, what does that mean? I, I should probably update that a little. We've definitely made a lot more progress since the white paper, but it's been mostly in code. We haven't actually translated that into the white paper, but the basic concept hasn't changed. But what we've been mostly doing has been, I guess you would sort of call it technical proof of concepts. So we've, for instance, we've created a, um, we've created a, a Python script that will translate this protocol and do it between two Gotennas. So, so we, we, can, uh, we can demonstrate, you know, multi-hop payments over a mesh network within, you know, a reasonable amount of time. So we've lowered, been able to show that lowering the bandwidth still works. And I mean, anybody who's sort of into Bitcoin, there's different implementations of Lightning. In this case, we actually did it with C Lightning. So we have a plugin for C Lightning that allows you to send a payment and a message combined over multiple Gotenna meshes that are connected to computers. Um, so that's that was sort of something that my colleague Will Clark has been working on over the last year. And, uh, and then another proof of concept is my other colleague, um, Jonathan Harvey Bouchel, He's a real ham operator, you know, one of these uh, amateur radio guys. So he basically took what Will had done over mesh network, I mean, over the Gotenna mesh, and has translated that into a system that works over ham radio. So that would be sort of our, one would be more kind of a analog- analogous with our, like a, what you would want to have on a mobile phone. And the other would be sort of a, a concept of how this could be also carried on over a gateway. Um, now that's that's our current status. So we've got this this working. Um, the next step is to now take these 
maybe more like a breadboarded version of the project and translated into a mobile phone so we could really start walking around and testing this out. And we also have a gateway that I'm working with a guy from um, Paul Victorini from uh, Tourmaline Wireless. And he, he builds these things into a box with like a solar panel and creates these cool uh, gateway, like actual physical gateways with a Raspberry Pi, for instance. And those are just plugged in the Ethernet to get to the to the regular internet. Well, yeah, we're, we're actually the first project that we're working on together is actually going to be a SMS gateway. So this would be something you could put out, yeah. and if the internet went down um, in a particular area, you could still mesh to one of these boxes, and then it would you know, one that was within range of a of a of a SMS um, tower and kind of go back and forth between this sort of blacked out mesh and the rest of the rest of the phone network. But I'd like to, what we would like to see is the ability for somebody to be able to roll their own, like you buy a Raspberry Pi, you run some scripts, you plug in a Gotenna, and now you've got your windowsill gateway, for example. Mm. Like that would be one, one project, uh, a, a sort of a, a cookbook think, for how you put it all together. I think that's the one I want to run. <laughs> Great. Okay, you're going to be patient zero then when, in New York where you live. <laughs> so, and, so that's And that will work that, with the existing like Gotenna Mesh hardware? Yeah, so this is all using Gotenna Meshes. We have an open SDK, so anybody can build you know, applications with this SDK, and we're, we're just using it like that. So you would download it. Um, you would get a device and have this, have this SDK installed with the scripts we need to sort of put all the pieces together. Um, so that would be one portion would be the gateway. And then the other portion would be a mobile app. And that's, that takes a little bit, you know, mobile apps are a little harder to work with. So that's where we're at now. That's what I'm trying to build now is to take, um, take this technology, like I said, that's sort of breadboarded out in Python scripts on a, on a computer and, and get it running on a mobile device so that we can do these same things that we've shown, you know, computer to computer, but now show it from phone to phone. And then eventually phone to phone to gateway. That would be the final kind of incarnation of this. And yeah, I, I think this is actually a good segue to some of the bigger picture stuff because there's this aspect of when you, you know, phones have uh, somewhat metered connections and they kind of keep track of, you know, I get a warning if I try mm -hmm. to download an audible book uh, when I'm not on my Wi Fi, you know? Uh, so there's a slight sensitivity, but, but it seems like you, you're not going to want somebody to just open up their web browser because every web page is like four megabytes these days, you know? Yeah. So like, so do, does traffic have to just originate from your app to, to not like spam the network? Yeah. I mean, that's this, this is why what we're talking about now is really, um, it's going to look to you like a messaging app. The only real difference might be that it has a it's a messaging app with some sort of a meter keeping track of not data but but satoshis. Mm -hmm. How much satoshis do you have on this this communication app, and how many are you gaining as people relay through you, or how many are you spending to send a message? So maybe we we'll call it postage or something like that. So you've got a postage meter that kind of goes up and down as you use it. That would be maybe a way to visualize this, but it would be it wouldn't be for general internet. It would only be for texting. So when you had your Wi-Fi turned off, you had your your mobile data turned off, you could still text with you know with once you've uh, topped up your Satoshi and, table. And there. then lightning payments on that same app would be like a next step. Yeah, or I well, I mean, I think if we do one, we'll do them both because it's okay. it is really just a different kind of. I mean, a lightning payment is just the same kind of thing, but without any text attached. Right. So so that would be maybe another way it would be different than your than your Signal app is it would be not just you know, that it costs you to send, but you could actually attach more value than you need. And then they, they would take that as a payment. And, you know, you would want to, this, this would take a lot longer for us just more from a UI standpoint, but you really would like it to be a full lightning wallet. That would be the, that would be the ultimate. So it's, it's right. got all the scanning and being able to pay and all that built yeah, in. What, what would the interaction? So if I'm not on the internet, uh, but I'm on go tenor rates, I, I, yeah. this is, Maybe a silly situation because typically if, if you're at a coffee shop, they've got internet there. <laughs> if they have a lightning terminal, <laughs> you know, fire it up, um, that's got to be connected to the internet. So you'd think they'd share a little bit of Wi-Fi, but maybe they've locked down their Wi-Fi. Um, and I scan a traditional lightning payment QR code yeah. with this uh, so, sort of wallet. You know, what mm -hmm. would happen? Yeah, there I guess you would want it to hop 
well, let's see. Yeah, you would pr- pretty much want it if you didn't have a direct connection with them. So, I mean, if you had a payment channel with them, it would just happen immediately right where you were. And it would never hit the internet, and it would never hit the mesh in that case. Oh, uh, well, if you were directly, there'd be no payment at all, I guess. Just the payment. There wouldn't be any, like, fees involved. Um, but let's say you're one or two hops away from your coffee shop, and those hops that connect you are, are within mesh range. Um, then you do this, this lightning dance I talked about where you kind of commit a payment to the mesh hop that you can get to, and then it eventually gets back to your coffee shop. Um, they give the proof, it goes, flows back, and now everybody, they got the payment, everybody in that mesh net, that, that um, chain of mesh connections also got a little payment, um, and it never actually hit the internet at all. So, doesn't, so it sounds very much like a traditional lightning payment, except you just have a vastly different routing protocol. Because, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's exactly right. So it's it does make it more difficult because you can't reach any node in the world. You know, you really have to find a route within your local network. But of course, the range is big, and and the payments are small too. One of the yeah, interesting things about Lightning is it's kind of limited by um, how much money you have in your wallet with each of your nodes. So you could open up a billion connections, but you couldn't have very much value in each connection on the internet because uh, even if you could connect to that many, you know, if there was 10,000 nodes, maybe the amount of value you could have with each node would not be very much, or you would have a lot of money that never gets used, just sits there. Um, now, since we're not really using it as a wallet, although you could use it as a wallet, if you're really just using it for communication, you don't really need a lot of value. So you, you would potentially have a lot of channels opened up with a small amount of value, at least, or you would have value as many channels as you needed to be connected. Um, now, that doesn't that sort of ignores the fact that there's a cost to opening and closing channels so there's there's some some economics in there that we still need to work out in and feel like see how it works but mostly it it just depends a lot on range if you have um, either a very dense network with a lot of people or you have a very long range radio um, then the odds are you're going to both be in range of some common node so if you look at it that way, like we, we have um, our Ram, um, who's our chief scientist, has done some, some computer simulations. And so if you look at sort of, I think it was Midtown Manhattan, it was uh, three, three, five miles or three kilometer by three kilometer area. Um, in that area, if you just had 25 randomly moving nodes, then that would be enough to create a real, what they call like a fully connected network. So you have two connections and can get to everybody within two or three hops. Hmm. So this is, this is really, you know, the longer the range, then the fewer nodes and the odds of you having a connection to where you want to go goes up a lot in a really non, non-linear way. So you don't need six degrees necessarily to get to Kevin Bacon because, yeah. and you're saying in this network, it's not that you have thousands of connections, but that your range is so broad. Yeah. that the few people that you are connected to are likely, you know, a hop away. Yeah, yeah. And if you're just doing something local like that, then the odds are you would you would probably have a connection with your coffee shop um, anyway, just because they're within range of the people you're normally in range with too. Um, and or a gateway. So if you were doing a payment further away, maybe it's not at the coffee shop, it's you're, you're buying something online then it's going to end up going to the internet. And once it hits the internet, it's going to turn into just a normal lightning payment and then mm-hmm. connect through. Then the mesh part of it is sort of out of the equation. And and, and so and, and a single transaction can obviously have both mesh, mesh hops and regular internet hops. Yeah, exactly. So that's, that's a big advantage for using the lightning network in a pretty much uh, like li- protocol compatible way. Um, even though the communication part might be incompatible you know what we what, how we talk to other mesh nodes won't be the same way we talk between internet nodes. That doesn't matter because the incentive system will be the same. So let's zoom out a bit. I I've gotten my coffee. I've texted my sister, <laughs> but now I want to watch Netflix. Ah, uh, okay. That's when you go home and you get on the internet. <laughs> I refuse. Um, yeah, well, I'm watching one of those terrible new reality shows, and I don't. I, I want my traffic to be somewhat anonymized. <laughs> All right. Uh, so how how would we how do we get there? Like, th- there's 
a, I mean, a famous, I don't know if it's, a, I don't know if there's a cool name for it in the mesh networking community, but with, with Netflix, uh, you have, um, you get like, it's like worst of all worlds with a mesh network somehow. I mean, maybe, maybe you could explain <laughs> why that would be so work so poorly over a mesh network, not just for the bandwidth considerations. Uh, let's see. Well, there, I guess there's two aspects. So the, the mesh part of it is just that the radio spectrum that we're using is it's lower wavelengths, which have longer range, um, and use less power, but, um, because it's like less bumps in the wave, you're basically transmitting less data per, per millisecond or per second. So mm-hmm. that's, that's the one, that's sort of the basic thing. Um, now, as far as like streaming Netflix goes, uh, you know, I don't know, I don't quite know what argument you're talking about because I guess there's the fact that it's, uh, I mean, here's what I would say is in theory, you can do anything you can do with your cell phone because the big difference between our current networks and the mesh network, or one of the major differences is the spectrum they use and the fact that they've got these sort of high powered master nodes, these high powered uh, central nodes that are the gateways between phones, but also the gateways to the internet. Um, and the reason you can't do that with current mesh nodes is, is that we don't have that spectrum. We can't use the really optimal LTE, you know, GSM spectrum. Um, and that's one part of it, but otherwise your phone is a mesh device. It's just not talking to the guys next to you. It's only, it's like crippled in a way. It can only talk to the base station. It can't, talk to other phones. There's actually some more technical details in there um, because we're using spectrum that anybody can use, like uh, your garage door opener or your, you know, there's a lot of different devices that use this spectrum because it is, a, it's unlicensed spectrum. Whereas your LTE, they paid a billion dollars or, or I don't know how many billions of dollars for that spectrum in New York. They know they're the only ones talking on that spectrum. And that also allows them to optimize in different ways. Mm-hmm. So, um, but, but in theory, your phone isn't any different, whether it's acting as a mesh device or whether it's acting to communicate through the, through the cell tower. Um, well, I guess what I think of as the Netflix problem is if you have a central server uh, that has all the Netflix movies on it, and I have a, a connection to that server, um, I'm just saturating my connection. Whereas if there's multiple hops to to something, I'm I'm saturating all of those connections along the uh, way. I and see. So, so I'm like in some sense, like I'm starving everybody because of my band. My my bandwidth demand isn't just me and my ISPs problem. It becomes yeah. everybody on the mesh network that decides to help me out. It yeah. becomes their problem. Yeah, I mean, I think for that for that next Netflix scenario, it, you're right. If if you really doing that over high bandwidth. If you've got a high bandwidth connection and it's, and it's using up all your mesh um, neighbors, then yeah, that that's in theory draining their battery. It's, it's using up their ability to communicate. It's maybe flooding the spectrum so other people can't talk, but, but that's only a problem if, if the spectrum is limited. I mean, if you were, let's imagine that same thing, but instead of talking over this ISM band that you actually had a Wi-Fi connection. So I was talking via Wi-Fi to my neighbor, and my neighbor was talking via Wi-Fi to, you know, to a gateway that's connected to the internet. Um, in that case, bandwidth might not be a problem. I mean, you if you've got five, um, yeah, five gigahertz Wi-Fi, you've got plenty of bandwidth for a few different streams going over that connection. Now, battery is a whole different question because Wi-Fi is very battery inefficient. Um, but assuming you know, but both of you had your phones plugged in, then the, the bandwidth wouldn't be a problem. Um, yeah, maybe I haven't thought about that problem too much, you know, the, the streaming, streaming internet. Um, it may also be that you don't do that with mesh nodes. You know, maybe you only do that. If you imagine a world where it's ubiquitous, that everybody's using a mesh network, uh, at some point it comes, um, becomes a little, I don't know if, like, if you're familiar with the history of the BitTorrent, at one point they tried this idea of incentivization, um, and it was more of like a tit for tat system, um, but at some point it became so many people running BitTorrent that they, that kind of fell away. There was always enough bandwidth um, through BitTorrent, and 
some of those concepts kind of apply to mesh because maybe it doesn't just go through one node. Maybe you can actually multicast it. So it's going through five or six nodes in different pieces and then get reassembled on your computer. Um, and yeah, I mean, are- I guess, I guess, like, I mean, the internet, the actual internet, it has some like paid peering, and it also yeah. has a lot of free peering. People just want better con- connectivity, so they want the they want the traffic. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a scaling up problem. I mean, if just like sending an SMS, and we're paying for each SMS in that scenario with the streaming, you'd be paying for every. I don't know, megabyte or, or hundreds of megabytes of data, perhaps at that, you know, because we're assuming now that these mesh devices are over higher bandwidth connections. Um, you know, maybe that's okay. Maybe, you know, maybe it it's, it's costing you for what you use and people are willing to do that. You know, people are willing to, you know, they set a price that, that it, where it's worth it to them. Um, but also more likely if you had that really ubiquitous network, you would also you would essentially end up with like a 5G network where there's just a lot of people with these boxes sitting in their window, and that's probably who you connect to. You probably connect to one of those guys who doesn't care about how much battery power it takes because they've just got it plugged into the wall anyway. Right. Um, it seems it seems so. I mean, I know 5G is complicated and you need big scary towers right now. Yeah. Um, but it feels like, you know, in a couple of years, you could have a, a 5G access point that's the size of a Wi-Fi router sitting in houses, and then that covers, you know, the neighborhood or maybe covers right. at least the surrounding houses or at least covers your own home. I mean... The- or, or could hop amongst homes. I mean, there, there are projects. So we sort of make a differentiation. We're doing a mobile mesh network, but there's a lot of other projects. Even in New York, there's one called NYC Mesh, hmm. um, which is a, what I call like community internet. And community internet is more like sharing internet via Wi-Fi between nodes. So I, I think that you could see these kind of concepts converging. So on the ground, you've got your mobile mesh, and that's maybe primarily SMS, maybe eventually voice, because that's actually really low bandwidth, all told. It's too much for what the spectrum we have, but with different spectrum, doing voice over mesh probably isn't a problem. Um, but then for really high bandwidth, for your immersive... 4D gaming or whatever you're doing now, um, maybe that's going to hop onto the community mesh network, which is really just a bunch of Wi-Fi links connected between homes. Um, and, and then it's going to eventually go backhaul to the, to the internet through somebody. Um, so that's, I think, I think this sort of hierarchical system is something that would develop in that, in that world. And so, but so you guys aren't focusing on that, but is that something that you guys like keeping an ear out? Like, oh, our network might actually integrate with this other network. Well, yeah, it, it's funny. My brother asked me this question too. He's like, well, why can't you just do these lightning payments as on an access point? So anybody who walks by, their phone just immediately negotiates a channel with them over the Wi-Fi, or 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 even does a light, you know, negotiates a lightning payment. It doesn't have to be an open channel, and just pays by the kilobyte. To, the, to any open Wi-Fi spot they happen to walk by. And honestly, I just think nobody's had time to do that. But that would be super easy to do. You wouldn't have to change very much. And the fact that what we're sort of focused on is low bandwidth doesn't even matter at that point. You could do it with the current Lightning Network because you've got plenty of bandwidth. Right. So wait, so how that would work is I, I have um, my Lightning node running somewhere or I have a well-connected Lightning wallet. Yeah. I see an open... Wi-Fi network that's adver- advertising, you know, pay pay for access with Lightning. Yeah. Open that up. It's got a QR code and and no, I don't no, have probably a not a QR code. I mean, it could do this all automatically. It just it's going to advertise. This is my rate for relaying data, like maybe relaying Lightning payments, even you know, if we're doing it like that. So it's going to say, "Here's my rate for relaying data," and you're going to say, "Fine," and then it'll just do the normal Lightning transaction you didn't really log into this network but it's going to relay lightning payments as long as long as it's getting you know it's because it's getting a payment for each of these light, lightning messages that go through it um, so you could you could do that and then um, my brother's a little more knowledgeable about sort of internet internet type stuff and he says that there's already protocols that probably would allow that to happen it just you would just need to turn them into lightning based protocols do you think that would be performant that's a good question um, Probably. I mean, it depends a little bit. If, you know, how much do you chunk the data? How much do you pay for? Maybe the payments are only, I mean, you could, you could just pay by the minute at that point. 
you could just say paid by the every 10 minutes even. I mean, it's a lot like when you're in the airport or you're in the, on an airplane, um, you know, they're charging you per data. Like the, the I wish we these... could just solve air, airport and airplane internet. Like I hate pulling out my credit <laughs> card in the middle of an airport to give it yeah. to this random access point. Right, right. I mean, it's just a different way of doing it rather than it going through your credit card. It would just be right. paid directly with Lightning. Uh, it just takes somebody to do it, I think, but uh, there's really no conceptual reason why that wouldn't happen. Um, so, it couldn't happen. So back to the, you were bringing a bandwidth in, and I mentioned before, I really wanted to talk about this. Um, I feel like I'm like the, the, the crackpot theorist. <laughs> or like, what if we abolish the FCC? Like, <laughs> could you could you help like walk through a little bit of what that would look like? Because you're, you're in an unlicensed band. I, I'm sure the FCC has some rules of what you're not allowed to do or power limits or whatever. Yeah. Um, what, what, what actual band are you in? It's the UHF, so it's okay. ISM, uh, like I, said, I think around 900 megahertz, so right. it's less and, than a gigahertz. And so, uh, that's, but that's higher than like whatever, the 600 megahertz 5G that they're doing, right? Man, I don't, I'm not as up on 5G, but it, it, a little bit I've read, it's, I thought it was higher band, because it's well, going to be both. higher band. They've got high oh. band and low band. Okay, and so yeah. T-Mobile is rolling out low band, and huh. they're, it's a lot easier for them to obviously cover a lot of geography. Yeah, the maybe other, that's like more of an IoT type of thing or something, because it would be lower bandwidth, I would think, too, at those at those. Yeah, but, but at least, but they have, it's all reserved. They're not having yeah. to fight interference like you guys are fighting. Ah, true, yeah. There's um, a lot you but, can do. Yeah. Like, I also, I also thought it's so ironic that, we have this little section of, of frequency. There's 2.4 gigahertz. There's five gigahertz. Yeah. I think there's now some new Wi-Fi opening up mm. around six or something. I forget. But like the carriers are so bad with hundred, they want to use that unlicensed spectrum to augment yeah. their own networks. Yeah, you can even go further too because there's a lot of tele old television frequencies that in theory could be made available. I think well UHF for example used to be a television frequency. Mm. Um, and there's more of it available, like lots of it available, but I mean, I'm not a real wonk on the frequency stuff, but I, but you're not, you're not the only crackpot here. I I've had that discussion as well. Like what would, what, how, how well would these mesh networks work if we had access to some of this bandwidth being used by the carriers? And it's really ironic because, you know, in theory, this is the people's frequency. We are having an mm -hmm. auction. We're selling it for billions of dollars. That money is going into the general coffer and then, then the people are also paying for it to the carrier. <laughs> so, you know, like, wait a minute, I, we just sold the people, the government sold it to the carrier, and now the carrier is selling it back to us. Feels like feels like maybe there's a way to cut through that a little bit. And and like you said, maybe that maybe that the the solution there could be, and they do it for a reason, I guess. I mean, the reason is if if nobody had that assigned to them, maybe they could say they can make the argument, well, it would be worthless because. Everybody would just be this free for all. It would be a, this this um, tragedy of the commons where it was totally uh, abused, and, and then nothing of value could be done. Um, but I, I know the vision that I think you have is a valid one. If if maybe the regulations at least were a little bit more light, and and were more about here is a protocol you can talk you can talk on this frequency. Um, but anybody who can make a device that can speak that protocol is is game, is good to go. And that protocol had something like, you know, had a um, a way to regulate how much it was used. So this idea of like of a lightning payment is a way to make it so that people don't overuse that frequency. Um, you know, anybody who's doing more broadcasting than than relaying is going to have to pay for it, uh, and in that way, um, keep it from becoming a free for all in a way, or, or make it more fair. What, uh, what would happen if there was just crazy demand it's not like anybody was abusing the system but just uh, there were a lot of messages going on yeah but what i mean if have you ever heard of t-mobile refusing a customer because oh you can't talk now because there's i mean yeah like yeah that does, times does happen, square. i guess you yeah, go times to times square, square that's true. <laughs> you you have full bars and yeah. i mean this is years ago i haven't been recently so i, I don't know what what's what's up what's the current situation <laughs> but this happened a lot Right. Well, you probably would have surge pricing. Is what you would have. I mean, you would have the you would have the Uber of data uh, emerge in those uh, places. So you start pricing people off the network to probably probably. So if you're just sending a cat picture to your neighbor, you might not be willing to spend what they want to 
charge, you know, to, to send it in the middle of Times Square. Um, you might just wait till you walk a few blocks away and then let it send. I mean, I could imagine just once you create a marketplace, then those kind of solutions become possible. Um, or maybe, yeah, or maybe you, if you're a merchant there and you're using that internet to sell your t-shirts, you maybe have a, arranged for some, you know, you've got a channel with somebody who's also a merchant on the other side of the square and you guys decide you will, um, you know, you will get, cut yourself a deal sort of so that you don't spend so much money. I don't know. I mean, there's a million ways you could cut it, I suppose, but the market market would come into play, I believe. Yeah, and I really like that idea of like if the whole internet was what's much more peer to peer. You know, like there's the classic Pringle scan networking. <laughs> you know, like you live across the street from your best friend and you love playing Counter Strike. You know, and so you know you you network via Pringle scan. Yeah, uh, and um, or you just run a Cat Five cable because you're crazy if you're next door neighbors, um, like. Uh, but but you know if, if I have a Netflix problem, I like find a way to to get a more direct connection to to a uh, someone that's got a cache of Netflix movies. You know. Yeah, I mean, your your even your Netflix example is interesting too because if you think of how the Tor network works, thing content which is in high demand. So on the night of the latest Game of Thrones coming out, um, you may not be streaming that from the head end from you know whoever is the producer of Game of Thrones it might actually have been cached by your neighbor because he's also been watching it. And so it actually isn't like two people streaming Game of Thrones from, then from, from the center, you know, from the uh, Netflix central. Um, you're actually just getting a, a cached version of it from your neighbor. So that's one way you can offload data in a way that you couldn't do it if it was all going through sort of the central ISP model. Well, and that's something, I mean, have you looked at all into like IPFS and like more like content, what is it called? Content addressable. The idea that you don't uh, have yeah. a permanent address for something, that the hash of that thing, the, yeah. that its footprint, its shape is is its address. And so you just ask the network, hey, can I have the content that looks like this? Yeah. I think BitTorrent's kind of similar. Yeah, yeah. BitTorrent, I think, is a very similar concept. I'm not that familiar with the IPFS, but I do I do understand what you're saying there. And I do think you could see that evolving. I mean, you could see um, different ways of, of kind of locally caching and, and requesting data uh, to happen like that. I mean, it doesn't have to be just be Netflix. It could be a popular tweet gets cached and resent. Mm. So you, you really push things out to the edges more. And it does make sense because in the 90s, or you know, whenever sort of mobile phones were really getting big, they were pretty simple devices. And going through a central carrier maybe made more sense, but now you've got such a powerful computer at your fingertips. There's a lot more that can be done. And um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I think my evil plan would be get people a taste of this. You know, just get people sending messages, get people sending text messages, and then maybe they're just going to be the the preppers who who have it, and um, you know, will show up on the evening news during the next blackout because they were able to still order pizza. Uh, you know, that's, that, that might be how it starts, but as it grows and people get a feel for what it's like and what can be done with the mesh network and peer to peer communication, um, you would hope that it becomes a little more normalized as, you know, BitTorrent honestly has in a lot of the world. Um, and, and then there would become some political will to, you know, people kind of wake up and say, why, why are we, why am I paying T-Mobile? Why am I paying AT&T for this? Um, when, when maybe if we were just given more spectrum for the, you know, we're, we're, we would rather see is that there were FCC, they would lobby the FCC to open up more spectrum and maybe allow some of that to be allocated for this incentivized mesh, you know, some sort of a mesh. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's my hope kind of in the long term of how this could evolve. It's not just a technological argument. It's also a, a change in mindset so that the, you know, communities demand this they demand give us back our bandwidth kind of give us <laughs> back our, our direct ability to communicate with each other and don't auction it off to some big corporation who's just going to sell it back to us with a lot of strings attached um, yeah i think i think there's it's, it's really interesting with kind of all these projects i'm looking into and focusing on with this with this podcast it's you know it's like it's not it's not as good in a lot of ways as the centralized version but there's this strong long-term upside if it really works out and so like i kind of want to be part of the cohort of people like <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not 
I, I, you know, I've got a box on my desk. It's literally in arms reach right now. It's a computer that doesn't have an operating system on it, and it's going to be in my Bitcoin fold out. But I'm not running a Bitcoin fold out right now. You know, um, like I, I, I clearly don't put the most effort into solving all these problems for myself. I did get off Gmail partially. Like I have a non Gmail address. Yeah. Like it, there's lots of there's a lot of effort required to kind of jumpstart these, but I kind of want to be part of that as much as I can tolerate. Yeah, no, it's great. I mean, it's great because you're also in a position where people can go, can, can join you on your journey and see, you know, you're the, you're the maybe blazing a trail that other people can be emboldened by when they see that you could do it. They, they might out, you know, you might en- enable other people to take that plunge too, which is great. Um, but I, yeah, I think that getting, you know, getting people to think this way. Yeah. You mentioned Bitcoin. I wanted to say something about that too, that um, being sort of a self-sovereign Bitcoin node, it's a lot of work. Um, but a lot of times people also talk about in the case of lightning, there is a bit of a first mover advantage. So right now, while fees are low, if you set up your Bitcoin channels, you open up channels with people, you become a routing node. Um, you're sort of, you know, from a business standpoint, if you're like thinking of your routing as a business, um, you're getting in kind of early, you're getting into, you're becoming a key part of the network early. Um, you mentioned like peering networks, you know, you might become somebody who people pay to peer with, you might become somebody who doesn't have to open up channels when channel fees are high, because you've already got a lot of channels. So, uh, I mean, eventually, you could see that also becoming a consideration, you know, later down the line, but maybe after the sort of initial first adopters and hobbyists have done it, there could start to be more commercial reasons why people want to be early into the network so that they can uh, they can collect some fees, you know, they can collect or they can just be connected without having to pay other people for those connections. Uh, so we'll, we'll see. But it's your basic point, I guess, so what I really wanted to say is centralized communication is by far the most easiest way to do things. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's not going to change. So it's always going to be more difficult to do it decentralized. But it's also going to be more fragile. I mean, this is true not just for communications. It's also true for money. As we're, you know, as you talked about with Bitcoin, you know, it's much simpler to just have one central bank printing all the money, but it's also a very fragile system, and we're seeing that very much in this day and age. Um, so, more decentralized might take longer to get going, but when it when it takes hold, it's going to be a lot more resilient to very big perturbations. And same for communications. Same for Education potentially. I mean, I don't know if that's a topic you're interested in, but um, you know, having having a more decentralized education system might yeah. you know, have some benefits. And I keep on asking. This is like my like um, like icebreaker question. Like, hey, <laughs> how many people do you think are going to keep homeschooling after this? Because uh, uh, I was I was homeschooled, uh, and I didn't think it was the most amazing thing at the time. I'm pretty pretty happy and proud of it nowadays because I feel yeah. like it just sort of. It made me think differently, you know, which is <laughs> which is obviously not <laughs> always the nicest um, uh, a trait to have, uh, but uh, I've found it very helpful and useful. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a great question. It's not just homeschooling. It's how many work from home people, for example, how many people decide maybe going into the office isn't really necessary and they're going to work from home now. And that's a kind of form of decentralization there where they become self-employed because now they work from home. They can work for multiple people. Uh, homeschooling is an interesting question. I, I, mean, I live in Sweden, and uh, homeschooling is looked at a lot differently here. It's pretty funny. I'm, I'm coming from the U.S. I'm, I, I wouldn't have mind homeschooling the kids. I thought, you know, but everything about Sweden is against that. It's impossible. You're yeah. actually like it's considered child abuse to homeschool your kids. Um, uh, but it's a little too bad. Uh, it's a place that could probably benefit from that. That more of that. But on the other hand, they also have voucher system unlike they have in the u.s so you could also just go to any school you want and pay the same freight which which would be great i mean i know there's this story out of like uh india like this really poor community like the public schools were kind of only serving the middle middle class and they were just completely unserved by public schools Hmm. so like a super poor community like setting up small local private schools for their kids like just you know really scrimping and saving to, to pull it off but like turns out really educating their kids very well because the parents were so directly invested in this. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, also talking about decentralized education now, rather than, um, well, actually in a way it's more centralizing, I guess, but the internet in in general allows you to 
set up an educational program where you learn from the best minds anywhere in the world. Mm. You, you don't have to just take it from, you know, if your chemistry teacher is bad in your local school, well, you're stuck. You know, you're not going to probably learn chemistry that well. But with the internet, you can a la carte take the best lecturer and the best lesson plan and, and create a, a a la carte experience for that. Um, That's a good point because I love that trend and that is kind of centralizing. So It is funny. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's, it's centralizing, but it's, eh, I guess you could say it's centralizing. I mean, but it's decentralized, dis- decentralized technology that makes that happen. Um, well, I mean, it's, work, it's yeah, work much from more home resilient. Yeah. I mean, work from home can do that too. If it, it amplifies, I think is what it, what it can really do. It can amplify, uh, you know, even in like Twitter, for example, somebody who's completely unknown, but you know, has a clever tweet or, or has a, a voice that people recognize can it really, you know, it can amplify with a lot of this decentralized technology. Well, and that's a lot of like, you know, fighting censorship, like the, the, the kind of the thing in the back of my head is like, you know, if I was in a major totalitarian regi- regime, or if someone is in one right now, um, how does that person who is going to lead the revolution, or at least just try to talk to their family, you know, mm-hmm. How do they communicate? How can they be stopped? Uh, yeah. So it's it's really cool that you're you're really hit, going after that one head on. I guess so. Yeah. I mean, it's it's not something you like to think would happen, but um, yeah. I mean, <laughs> having this pandemic, for example, I think has opened people's eyes that it can happen pretty quickly. You know that um, you know governments may be doing it for the right reasons now, but they could do the exact same things for the wrong reasons and. And then what would be your recourse? I mean, I think that's your point. Like, yeah. you, would, you would like there to be a recourse. <laughs> recourse is a, per- a perfect word for it. Um, well, I love your evil plan. I'm looking forward <laughs> to getting the Raspberry Pi node thing to, right after I get my Bitcoin full node. <laughs> Great. You need that, yeah. sure. Um, but yeah, and then I can uh, then I can send messages within a four mile range, and then hopefully someone will join my mesh network, and, and we'll be off to the races. Great. Um, so, but yeah, thank you so much for coming on the show. And how can people find you, follow you, and buy Gotenna messages? <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, well, um, it'd be, we very much welcome you to the revolution as our as one of our early adopters. It's exciting. Um, I'm I'm R E Myers underscore on Twitter. That's that's a good way. You can my DMs are open if anybody wants to chat more. Um, we also have a website for Global Mesh Labs. It's just globalmeshlabs.org. So you go there. You can get a link to the white paper and um, also on GitHub, if you go to my GitHub, it's the same as my Twitter, or I think it's linked to my Twitter. Um, you can sort of see some of the projects we're working on and we're looking for people like you, Paul, who want to test this stuff. I mean, that's really where we're at now is we're going to have some pretty janky, you know, fairly early prototypes, but if people are excited and they want to give us feedback and tell us what works and what doesn't, uh, you know, we'd love to have that. And if you're a developer, obviously, um, this is all open source. We'd love to have people contributing and, if you have a different kind of radio, you got a low raw radio or something else, and you want to try this stuff out, super, super excited to help you and, and get that going. So, yeah, awesome. Hope, I'm, join, I'm hope definitely gonna, joins up. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna follow the GitHub, see if there's anything that I can sweet dip, dip, dip into. The last time I tried to do <laughs> something with um, like it was what's it called uh, FFT. What, what what when you like try to like mo- I was trying to modulate a, d- a data signal. Oh yeah, FFT, into, a fast Fourier transform. I was is, I was trying to create an audio modem, and <laughs> nice. I I did not understand any part of the stack. It it was a real tragedy. Uh, <laughs> but it was it was fun to look into. Yeah, well, I mean, there's always the, you know, for any level of expertise too. I mean, sometimes if you just want to plunk around with the code, um, you know, that makes you a good debugger. You know, that makes you somebody who can find problems. So. Hmm. Anyway, lots of lots of opportunities. I heard you talking about Rust when you we were talking before, and um, that's one of the projects we're looking at right now for our mobile is to use the Lightning Development Kit that the Square Crypto guys are funding because um, it's it's meant to be this sort of modular Tinker Toy system of Lightning. So um, actually, one project that Will Clark, my colleague, again worked on was um, adding some of these changes we did to see Lightning, but adding it to the LDK. So we could try to do that. So. What 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 is the difference? I mean, because I thought C Lightning is very modular. Obviously, I'm a huge Rust fanatic, and I try to <laughs> hold hold myself back in, in <laughs> constant advocacy. <laughs> that, that's a that's a constant trade. I'm I'm a C plus plus developer, but I'm so interested in learning Rust. So I, I 
I feel like I would fall down that rabbit hole too if I had the time to really dive in. Um, but yeah, the difference is mostly, I mean, sea light, the problem with sea lightning, and we love sea lightning. It's super, it's been a great way for us to get this thing going on a PC, but there's just some idiosyncrasies to the way it's built that make it hard to run on mobile because mobile has this weird life cycle um, behavior. And it's just, it's just difficult to do that because of ways sea lightning is made, at least in its current form. And that's, but that's one of the strengths of the LDK is that it's very much, they call syscall free. So it, you know, you bring your own internet, kind of bring your own sockets, bring your own database. Um, so it just makes it a little nicer to run on mobile. And that's still pretty early. Nobody's really got that working on mobile, but that's that's the direction we're looking at because so the C other Light- parts are easy. Sea Lightning is designed to be easily extended and pluggable, but yeah. but it, but you can't necessarily swap out the core internals as easily. Yeah, it's it's a, there's some weird things that it does where it launches a lot of um, sub processes which is fine and it's actually very efficient on a PC, but mobile is kind of locked down and doesn't deal with those. It could just kill one of your threads and you wouldn't know it. It wouldn't give you much warning. So that's, from my understanding, that's been a bit of a challenge to get it onto mobile. There are probably other ways to do it, but but just as it stands now, there's some problems. Um, you know, probably the way you would use Sea Lightning is not having the whole thing running on mobile, but doing it in some some sort of half-half way. Um, but, but that's, you know, we might, we still use, we would still like to use C lightning for our gateway, for example. Um, cause then you could run it on a lot of different small devices. Uh, it just might be for mobile. We have to wait for, for some changes. Um, and the LDK again, it's nice cause we're, we're, we really want to change the protocol in some ways that wouldn't make sense on the internet, which is where C lightning is really optimized. Um, you know, we want to do some things that are kind of unholy, like not using onion routing and not using, oh. um, you know, so that 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 is easier to do in, in LDK, or it appears like it'll be easier to do is swap out like that whole section and still be able to use the other parts. Dude, I love it. I'm so excited about <laughs> what you're working on. I'm definitely I'm following I'm following you on Twitter. I'm just I'm just there <laughs> waiting for that node to land and uh, great. Well, I'll try try to get you something as soon as we can. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks uh, and have a good day. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, Talk really to you really soon. Appreciate it. Bye. So I'm so good at <laughs> goodbyes. <laughs> <laughs>